Hey team, Dr. Jack Gordy here, and in this video, we're going to be going through how did we get these beautiful images here? Over here, we've got a lymph node. Over here, we've got a spleen. How did we capture such amazing images? And I mean, really, the answer is fluorescent microscopy. How does this work? How do we get these amazing images through fluorescent microscopy? Well, to understand fluorescent microscopy, Microscopy, we need to understand fluorescence. So what is fluorescence? Well, fluorescence is essentially, we've kind of all got experience with fluorescence. We've all been to the clubs and we've all, um, uh, you know, seen our white shirt grow, glow bright blue under a black light. So we've all sort of had some intuition and some experience with fluorescence. So the, but the key, just to break it down, the key to fluorescence is that there is a color change. So in fluorescence, we have an excitation wavelength, something that will excite the thing that we're trying to look at. And that is typically high energy light, which means high frequency light, right? High energy, high frequency light. So we can see here, and in fluorescence, it changes the high energy excitation light to a lower energy emission wavelength or emission light that we talk about. So it's really just a color change. That's the key to fluorescence. We take in high energy, high frequency wavelength, which is the excitation light, and we end up with an, something in the tissue um, causes uh, a change in that wavelength to a lower energy wavelength, lower frequency, and we call that the um, emission wavelength. So in the clubs, what are we getting here? Well, we've got this uh, white shirt here and it's being hit with high energy UV. Now, one of the key points here is our eyes cannot see UV. So without the fluorescence, everything looks black, right? That's why it's called a black light. It doesn't actually contain visible light that we can see. But the white shirt is then going to take this high energy um, um, excitation wavelength, this high frequency, high energy excitation wavelength, and it's going to lower it. So it has a lower energy, lower frequency um, emission wavelength. And this is what we can see, right? So we've gone from an invisible light to a visible light, and that's why it really pops. That's why it seems like it is glowing in the dark. And that um, blue light we can see, so that's why the shirt has turned blue. So this whole thing wouldn't really work if we could see the excitation wavelengths, if we could see that high energy UV, because if we could see it, that would overwhelm the signal, because yes, we would get that color change from the UV to the blue light, but we would get much more just random bouncing off of the excitation wavelength. So if we could see that, um, it would destroy the fluorescent properties of it. But fortunately, our eyes filter out the UV light of the uh, black light in the club, so we can only see the blue light getting to the back of our eye, so it looks like it's glowing in the dark, which is kind of magical. Um, and, you know, we're kind of familiar with what it would look like if we could see the excitation wavelength. Um, it would just look like a white shirt. If you think about it, when you're walking around outside um, and wearing a white shirt, UV light is hitting your white shirt and it's being converted from white light to blue light. But it's just being uh, because the sun contains UV, but it's just being overwhelmed by the visible light spectrum. So um, the key there is that you need to filter out the excitation wavelength. Um, in order to really see the fluorescent color change, that color change that happens with fluorescence. So this is the two essential components of fluorescence. We need a color change from a high energy, high frequency excitation wavelength that needs to change after hitting the fluorescent substance to a lower energy, lower frequency emission wavelength, right? So there's excitation and emission. Um, and then we also need to filter. We need to filter out the high energy excitation wavelength. Otherwise, that signal is going to overwhelm what we see. So those are the two essential components of fluorescence. But how do we get this color change when we do biological research? What's going on there? Well, actually, there was a couple of Nobel Prizes associated with this. Um, and one really good example is the green fluorescent protein. This is one of the first things we ever, um, first proteins we ever discovered that was fluorescent. It is the first protein that we ever discovered that was fluorescent. Now, this is a protein, and we can use this protein in research to label things. Now, when we do that, it's called a fluorophore. That's a fluorescent 
thing essentially it could be a dye it could be a protein but the thing that we use to fluorescently label something in biological research we call a fluorophore now the first one ever discovered um, first protein ever discovered was the green fluorescent protein now this was discovered in jellyfish now these jellyfish naturally fluoresce green they actually produce their own light through an enzyme called luciparase um, and that light then excites their green fluorescent protein and so here we had these beautiful glowing green jellyfish. Now, because of the genetic revolution, this had some important implications. Because it's a protein, there must be a gene that corresponds to it. Remember, DNA is turned to mRNA. mRNA is then um, translated on a ribosome into a protein. So there was a gene that contained a fluorescent protein. Now, we can then take that gene and insert it into other places. And now that other thing will express that fluorescent protein or that fluorophore. And that's exactly what we did and as part of this Nobel Prize research. And this is a science paper in 1994. Um, it got the cover of Science Magazine, which if I ever got, I would just scream and run around, pull my shirt over my head or something like that. It would be the peak of my career ever. But yeah, they took that gene from the jellyfish and inserted it into a coli. So here we can see a bacterial streak with that green fluorescent protein. And here's a bacterial streak that hasn't been genetically engineered. So it doesn't have that green fluorescent protein. And here is a C. elegans in the same paper. Remember, I've introduced E. coli and C. elegans as model species. Um, and so this is kind of brilliant. This one paper used them both. So this is a genetically engineered bacteria. This is a genetically engineered C. elegans. Now, importantly, they inserted the gene into a location that is only turned on in neurons. So a location in the chromosome in which this gene is only switched on in neurons. Um, and so by inserting in there, we can now only see the neurons so we can kind of see the brain of the c elegans there's actually kind of multiple brains in the c elegans they're called ganglii and we can see the spinal cord running down uh this worm here which is amazing um and so these are some beautiful images and yeah this is the green fluorescent protein as a marker for gene expression such a humble title for a nobel prize winning thing um in 1994 science it was brilliant amazing so let's see how that works under a microscope. How do we work with it now that we've got it? So let's take, this is a regular piece of non-genetically engineered tissue. So there are no fluorophores in here. We will hit this tissue with a laser that emits only one wavelength, the excitation wavelength. And in this case, it is uh, blue for the green fluorescent protein, even UV as well. Um, bluey, green, uh, bluey UV wavelengths excite the green fluorescent protein, but the, remember there is no GFP or green fluorescent protein in this tissue. So the blue light comes out, it hits the filter, and it doesn't reach our eyes, right? So under a non-genetically engineered piece of tissue, the resulting image is black, right? But let's say we genetically engineer it and we insert the GFP gene, the green fluorescent protein gene, into a region of the DNA that's only switched on in macrophages. Let's say that's for, for an example. And we can see a lovely giant macrophage here sitting in the tissue. Here's a blood vessel. Here's our big eater, our big blue macrophage there. So now um, by inserting it into that location in the genome, only macrophages are going to switch on that green fluorescent protein gene. So now we can see that the macrophage is full of green fluorescent protein, but none of the other tissue is. So now the blue light's going to come down. It's going to excite the green fluorescent protein. Um, and we're going to get blue light bouncing off. You always get blue light bouncing off, but it hits the filter and it's filtered out. But now some of the fluorophore, the green fluorescent protein fluorophore, will change the wavelength of light from the high frequency, high energy excitation wavelength to a lower energy, lower frequency emission wavelength, which is green. And that can pass through the filter. We, in, we intentionally have this filter here. Um, and that will hit our light and the resulting images, we end up with this green macrophage here surrounded by blackness because there's no other macrophages in that tissue. Now the, uh, the microscope setup is almost exactly the same as a light microscope. The direction of light is typically different. Instead of coming from below, it comes from above. Um, and the light is of course a laser wavelength. The other tricky thing that a fluorescent microscope can do is the filter is kind of built into a mirror. So, um, 
the filter is a mirror, which allows the uh, excitation wavelength to bounce off the mirror and the emission wavelength to pass through the mirror. But basically, it's just a filter is a way to think about it. This is your basic setup, and that's actually a mirror rather than um, just a straight up filter. Uh, but this is the basic setup of a fluorescent microscope. Now let's see what happens if we didn't have the filter in there. What would happen if we didn't have the filter? We would get hit with loads of blue light. More excitation blue light would be bouncing off that tissue than any of the emission green wavelength. And so the image would just be overwhelmed with the blue signal, right? So that filter is essential. Remember those two essential elements of fluorescent microscopy is the change in wavelength, so the excitation wavelength must drop down in frequency and energy to become the emission wavelength. It must be a change in color, basically. And we need to filter out the excitation color, the excitation wavelength. And that's how we can get beautiful images like this. This is uh, called Profile Picture, which is such a fantastic name because it's a profile image of an embryo mouse. Actually, it's facing this way. So this is the embryo of a mouse. I think it's 16 days old. And in it, a, the fluorescent protein is labeling a few things. One of it's tubulin. Um, so GFP, the green fluorescent protein, is actually attached to tubulin, which is a structural protein. Then we have blue, which is attached to uh, blue fluorophore is attached to the DNA and a red fluorophore is attached to the muscle. Now because the different colors we can actually overlay these images you take the image one at a time. So you take a green image, a blue image and a red image and then you can overlay it to look at multiple things at the same time which is beautiful. So here we can see in green we've got the brain which is full of tubulin because the uh, processes, you know, the spiky axons and dendrites of neurons are full of tubulin. So the, the brain is coming up green. Here we can see the tongue and the heart are coming up red. And that's because that red fluorophore was attached, attached to myosin, which is a muscle protein. Um, so you can see how you can start to label things uniquely. And then blue is just nuclei. So blue is actually sort of all the way throughout these tissues. But you can see the regions of the tissue that don't have a lot of tubulin or myosin into it. Um, and it just really is just staining in the nuclei, like these rib bones here don't have any of the other proteins, so you just see these rib bones coming up blue. But that's a beautiful image, and it's the kind of images we can get when we start to use those fluorophores of different colors and stacking those images on top of each other to create these beautiful, beautiful images that we can see here. Yeah, so that's fluorescent microscope fluorescent microscopy. In the next few videos, we're going to sort of tie all the immune system together and we'll show some fluorescent images in there so we can see what happens after you get a bacterial infection or a viral infection or a helmet infection. What is the cascade of the immune response that occurs? And we're going to use fluorescent imaging to help us understand that uh, cascade. Thanks.